Ladies and gentlemen, our ocean is facing an unprecedented crisis. Climate change, pollution, biodiversity loss, and land use change are driving the ocean to the brink. The scale and magnitude of the devastation is so colossal that it might trip the normal functioning of our planet for quite a long time. We humans have caused it. The base structure of the human economy, that is our human society, that is our economic system, is designed to externalize the costs of growth and development to the nature. Unfortunately, this is something that even Karl Marx could not foresee in his otherwise brilliant critique of capitalism. But Marx lived on a different planet, one with far less carbon dioxide in the air. No plastics in our ocean. So let us forgive Marx and let us ponder over what might happen if the ocean trips and how to prevent that. The Earth behaves as a single self-regulating system comprised of physical, chemical, biological and human components. The ocean performs critical functions in maintaining the necessary conditions for life on Earth. Ocean scientist Dr. Silver Earl rightly called it the blue heart of the planet. This phrase has stuck with me for quite a long time as the most apt description of the place of the ocean in our planet's system. I teach scuba diving now, and my interaction with the ocean is quite intimate. But under Dr. Earl, I came to this realization to a very different route. As an aerospace engineer and as a science fiction aficionado, I've always followed with great interest the progress in space exploration and the search for life beyond Earth. Drawn to the vastness of space, and the fascinating words which I thought lied there, I was brought back to Earth by these series of images of Earth, known as the Blue Marble series, first taken by Apollo 17 astronauts and subsequently by satellites. We all know 71% of the Earth is ocean, but here you can actually appreciate that the Earth is an ocean planet, and the ocean is its blue heart. The ocean regulates the planet's climate and its long-term habitability by absorbing vast amounts of carbon dioxide. Present concentrations of carbon dioxide, which is the major byproduct of fossil fuel combustion, responsible for ongoing global warming, are about 50% higher than they have ever been in the last at least 800,000 years. And yet these would have been much higher had the ocean not been absorbing vast amounts of carbon dioxide over the past 200 years of human industrial activity. But the human activity has reached frenetic levels, and there are no signs of it abating. The ocean cannot keep pace with these levels of emissions. Marine life and marine ecosystems are facing an existential crisis due to ocean acidification caused by additional amounts of carbon dioxide absorbed by the ocean. Phytoplankton, the primary building blocks of marine life, suffer from stunted growth as the ocean waters become more stagnant. The global heat exchange mechanism between the equator and the poles is in danger of being shut off as the glaciers melt and more fresh water is added to the ocean. Let us talk about ourselves to live close to the ocean. The coasts are the interface between the land and the ocean. They're also the most important habitats for marine life, both biologically and economically. Coastal zones 
have very highly productive ecosystems such as estuaries, mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass beds, kelp forests, and coral reefs. Coastal zones are immensely rich in marine biodiversity. Fish, turtles, sea snakes, crustaceans, sharks, dolphins, stingrays, and manta rays are only a few of the components of these immensely diverse ecosystems. The coral reefs and the rock coral assemblages that we have here in Pakistan have a very high gross primary productivity, which is why they are hotspots of marine biodiversity. But these coastal ecosystems are in a precarious balance with themselves, such that what is produced is mostly consumed within the system. And the surplus is only sufficient for limited sustenance fishing. Large-scale commercial fishing can fast deplete the key species and degrade these ecosystems. That's why they have to be carefully managed against commercial overfishing. And apart from overfishing, other human-induced stresses, such as destructive fishing practices and marine pollution, also emanate and transmit to the coastal zones. Marine protected areas protect marine biodiversity against harmful human activities and ensure the sustainable use of ocean resources. They protect the habitats and ecosystems instead of the individual species. The Convention on Biological Diversity requires, at least, requires its members to have at least 10% of the marine areas and the coastal waters declared as marine protected areas by 2020. On Pakistan's uh, coastal belt of over 1,000 kilometers, there is not a single marine protected area. But creating marine protected areas is not sufficient in itself to protect the ocean and the marine biodiversity unless they are managed properly. In fact, most MPAs fail due to poor management. The management of MPAs is an extremely complex task, requiring a focus on a number of important factors, such as creating robust ecological and socio-economic monitoring regimes, resource generation for sustenance of the MPA, intervention, and most importantly, community involvement. I will talk about this last factor because this is the key to a successful MPA. Coastal zones are home to about one-third of world's populations, population, which means that coastal communities hold the key to our ocean's future. But our co local coastal communities and their traditional fishing grounds are facing a deepening crisis. Due to commercial overfishing and marine pollution, fish stocks are depleting which forces them to fish even longer and harder. This depletes the fish stocks further, and the fishing activity is fast becoming one of diminishing returns. Unsustainable development and unregulated tourism has made the lands lucrative for urban revelers, tour operators, and real estate developers, and they are being forced to give them up to escape the spiral of poverty imposed upon them due to dwindling fish stocks and unregulated, uh, unregulated development. A properly conceived marine protected area must therefore aim to protect not only the marine ecosystems, but also the lands and the livelihoods of the local coastal communities. Last year, I returned from Africa where I was working, traveling, diving, and observing the management of the marine protected areas. Most of the successful MPAs in the developing countries are where the local communities have partnered with government or the non-government stakeholders. Diving around Tern Island in the southwest of Karachi, I realized that this biodiversity-rich hotspot was under immense stress from marine pollution, from overfishing, industrial activity, 
irresponsible mass tourism. The island and the coastal zone surrounding it are a prime candidate for being a marine protected area. Inaction would deprive the area of its uh, biodiversity and the local coastal communities of their livelihoods. Channel and community consists of uh, five major coastal villages. Uh, and all of them, to some extent, depend on the services generated by the island ecosystem. We decided to adopt a community-based approach by creating a network of community marine conservancies, which together would form the China Island Community Marine Protected Area. We set up our first community-based marine conservancy at Bulegi, which is a centuries-old fishing town in the southwest of Karachi. The neighborhood here is an important nesting ground for sea turtles and the ocean floor extending several kilometers in either direction is an assemblage of corals on rock teeming with a variety of marine life. The community here is under increasing urban pressure. Fish catches are dwindling and the commercially important fish species are disappearing. Yet each year, a fresh crop of fishermen join their older family members in the same vocation. There are more than 200 fishing boats in the village, but the space to accommodate them on the beach is fast shrinking as the community elders and the financial strains have given up vast tracts of the beach to the city's elites who have made fancy beach huts, which they use as weekend getaways. The remaining tract of beach, about 100 meters, is used by the local fishermen as the landing ground. And when we first found it, it was littered with tons of marine debris, including plastics, fishing nets, textiles, plastic bags, and a lot more. The local household discharged their sewage directly into the ocean or on the beach. At the Conservancy, our focus has been on tackling the problems of overfishing, marine pollution, and destructive fishing practices. Our main challenge has been to focus, to concentrate on financial resource generation because the protected area is designed to be self-sustainable. We have to develop ecological monitoring mechanism, and most importantly, create an alternate livelihood scheme for the local community which would be scalable and which would provide sufficient incentive to the community youth to prefer it over fishing. So, we have created an elaborate ecotourism infrastructure in the village. The ecotourism infrastructure includes an eco-lodge, a world sports center, a paddy scuba diving center, a cafe, a restaurant, and a coffee shop, all managed by the locals. In addition, we have focused on blue economy projects, which redirect the traditional skills and crafts of the local community, such as fishing net repairs and boat building skills, into producing commercially viable products. Fishing nets and marine ropes are now turned into fashion accessories, which are marketed at high-end outlets. The salvage from the nearby Gardani shipbreaking yard is value added to create home accessories. We have also trained the community youth as scuba divers and as marine park rangers to help us retrieve a marine litter from inside the ocean and to uh, help us also in visitors' management. One of our main focus is on prevention of the influx of marine debris into the ocean by creating social barriers against littering through education and awareness. We have a comprehensive education program in place known as Environmental Conservation Education and Awareness Program, or EC in short, which also provides a platform for interaction between the local communities and the conservationists from other strata of society. After ARG Marine Conservancy, we
We are now poised to set up two more conservancies at two more villages. Together, these three conservancies are going to form the Chena Island Marine Protected Area, which will effectively provide protection over 100 square kilometers of marine area. And under these uh, circumstances and the environment in which we live, I believe that this is the way forward. We have to protect our ocean. We intend to create a network of marine conservancies along the entire coastline in the next five years. At the moment, we have taken over the management of the blue economy enterprise, but the management will be gradually handed over to the locals, and we will only focus on providing technical expertise and coordination of the protected area management. And by the end of five years, we intend to extend the ambit of protection to approximately 1,000 square kilometers of marine area. Hopefully. Thank you. <laughs>